lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. One of the L'Oreal branches received a question from someone who visited or someone they know visited a blog site of Christian feminists uh, who have been attacking the interseal position and things like this, and they're into women teachers and things like this, and they're at odds with myself and Moriel because we believe leadership is male. And they claim, according to the person who contacted us, that I did not believe that the rapture was between the sixth and seventh seal prior to the authors Bob Van Campen and Marv Rosenthal that I'm, I simply built on and corrupted their groundbreaking work. That's the phrase that was used. Uh, and they take issue with the fact that I believe that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, that although I'm not pre-trib myself, I do believe that pre-trib people are correct about the identity of the restrainer in Second Thessalonians. That seemed to have had them angry, <coughs> according to the person who contacted us. And also, they want me to explain in brief what is meant by the shattering of the power of the holy people. Now, again, this blog side of these feminists, I ignore them. We did try to reason with them at one point, but you can't reason with people who are not reasonable. This one woman who's extremely ignorant. And when we pointed out that John 16, verses 20 to 25, is speaking about the last days. It's speaking about the return of Jesus. Jesus says so directly. It's a passage that is eschatological. When Jesus tells his apostles that he's going to go away, but he's going to return, and they're going to mourn when he goes away, but they're going to rejoice when he comes back. It says, truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the thalipsis in Greek, <coughs> translated usually anguish. Because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. I will see you again. Therefore, you have grief now, but I'll see you again. He's speaking of his return. He uses the term thalipsis, and he uses the same motif of birth pangs found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and the Olivet Discourse, and also Revelation chapter 12, etc. So, the Lipsis, last days, his return, and the motif of the birth pangs. He's plainly speaking about the end of the age. This rather ridiculous woman says, no, he isn't. I can't reason with an ignoramus. I'm not trying to insult her, but the woman is plainly some kind of a charlatan, wanting to be a teacher uh, and wanting to teach men. Now, again, it's a little cyber cult. It's a thing where the women want to wear the trousers and they expect the men, and there's these men who come to them, apparently, who wear the skirts. This is a complete inversion of God's order. It's a shame and a disgrace that these men who pander to her are wearing skirts while she's trying to wear trousers with these other women. The whole thing is ridiculous. And again, the woman is demonstrably ignorant. She does not know how to interpret Scripture in light of Scripture, so I ignore her. I don't go to the blog site. I don't pay any attention to them. But let's Someone comes to me, though, who's seen it or is troubled by it. I have to give them an answer, so I will. Uh, even though I ignore them, I will give this person who contacted a Moriel branch the answer that, that they're looking for. First of all, the woman is 
demonstrably lying. Please watch my broadcast. Available on Moriel TV, on Vimeo, and on YouTube. Watch the broadcast. I never stated that I believed the rapture was between the sixth and seventh seal before either Bob Van Campen or Marv Rosenthal. I never stated I did. Now, I may have. I'm not sure. I don't know if I did or I didn't. It may have been concurrent. The Lord may have showed them when he showed me. I don't know. As far as I recall, Bob Van Campen developed his ideas, his, his formulated his position from the mid-70s through to the early 80s. I'm not sure about Marv Rosenthal, but Bob Van Campen was the mid-70s to the early 80s, to the best of my recollection. Watch the broadcast. You will see that this woman, this person, if she said that, she's lying. What I said was, I believed it prior to their books being published, which crystallized the term pre-wrath. You can go back to the 1970s and prove that I believed the rapture was between the sixth and seventh seal before Bob Van Campen's book was published in 1997 and before Marv Rosenthal's book was published, I think it was in the early 1980s. You can prove I believed it before those books were published, and that's all I said. I never said I believed it before them. I never said I was the first one or the only one who believed it before them. I don't even know when they first believed it, for sure. I may have believed it before them, but I never spoke to them about it. I don't know Marv very well. I've met him once or twice. I led one of his missionaries in Israel to the Lord uh, before he obviously became a missionary. Uh, and I've met him th through him and through his brother I met. But I don't know Marv very well. I did know Bob Van Campen. I'd been to his house when he was still with us, and I know his staff. I know the people who run Sign Ministries. Uh, Roger Best, who's now semi-retired. I know Charles uh, Cooper, the author, excellent scholar, excellent author. Uh, and I did spend time with Bob Van Campen, and I knew what he believed. They were interested in me because they found me curious and that I was a Pentecostal who had beliefs along the same line as theirs. That's why they found me interesting. Uh, they say that these books were groundbreaking and that I corrupted it and built on <laughs> I can prove that I believed my position independent of them. I didn't even know who Bob Van Campen was until the late 1980s, and I didn't know who Marv Rosenthal was until the early 1980s, and I knew about him not because of his eschatology, but because he and I were both involved in Jewish evangelism. Well, talking to Bob Van Campen, Roger Best and their staff. This ridiculous notion that their work was groundbreaking is directly contrary to their own claims. Sign Ministries, the publishing company of Bob Van Campen, and Bob Van Campen supported the ministry of uh, Marvin Rosenthal. One of the first things they did was publish the out of publication works of Dr. Samuel Tregalis. They were saying, we're not the first ones who believe this. They were saying there was Darby, followed by Schofield, and there was Dr. Tregalis. But because of church politics and other reasons, Darby came out on top in terms of popularizing his pre-trib view. Other early dispensationalists, other founders of the Brethren movement did not agree with Darby, Tregalis being the leader, because he was the Greek scholar, he was more learned than Darby. They didn't claim it was groundbreaking. They were simply saying, look, this was not the only position of Darby. There were other people who believed this, what Tregalus believed. And they went back to the patristic history and said, look, look at Papias, Hagesippus, Irenaeus, the early pre nicene church fathers most associated with the apostles didn't believe pre-trib either. They never claimed that set a precedent or that it was groundbreaking. 
They were simply reacting to the predominance of this pre-trib position that came mainly from Darby and Schofield. To say that I built on it, when I believed what I believed before the books were published or even written, this is called slander. I can prove that I believed my position long before these books were published, and I never said I believed it before Bob Van Campen or Marv Rosenthal. Listen to the broadcast yourself. You will see that this woman is a slandering liar with no principles. She's a Christian feminist who wants to be a teacher, but she doesn't even know how to handle the scripture. It's a cyber cult following a woman. Men who wear dresses. Women who wear trousers. That's what it is. It is Christ dishonoring scam. It's a joke. I don't go to that blog site or website, I just ignore them. Not only do they knew, not know how to handle scripture exegetically, now they're lying and engaging in slander. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. She's saying that I built what I believe on these books. I believe what I believe before these books were even published and can prove it. If you're going to tell lies, at least tell believable ones. But she's not that clever. Now, the shattering of the power of the holy people. This is found three places in the book of Daniel and two places in the book of Revelation. Let's begin with the book of Revelation. Chapter 13. Verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance, the hupomony, and the faith of the saints. This is going to go on for some time. For how long? It goes on three and a half years. We go back to chapter 11, the ministry of the two witnesses and what happens after they're killed. There is a three and a half year, that is 42 month period. Jesus had three and a half years. The Antichrist demands equal time to do as he wishes. In Revelation chapter 14, we read about it in verses, verses 11 and 12. Following the mark of the beast and the mark of his name, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God. There's going to be this period, according to Revelation chapter 11, Revelation 13, and Revelation chapter 14, where the church is going to be under a very, very intense persecution. This corresponds also to the horsemen of the apocalypse earlier in the book of Revelation. Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 6, the fifth seal on the martyrs in verse 9. This draws on the book of Daniel. Bearing in mind, Revelation chapter 11 puts this at a three and a half year period. In Daniel chapter 7, we find the first instance Verse 21, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, at that, and at that time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. You have the ten horns, the same as you have in Revelation 12, immediately following it. Then you have in Revelation, uh, Daniel chapter 8, you have the same reference again, or reference to the same thing. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people in Daniel 8, 24. And finally, in Daniel chapter 12, we see there is a shattering of the power of the holy people. 
there are two aspects of this shattering. One of which concerns believers. That's the perseverance of the saints who must face the Antichrist for a brief time before being raptured. Then there is Israel. Until now, the nation Israel is still being divinely protected. They won the War of Independence in 1948. They won the war in 1956 and 1967 against unbelievable odds. They won the Yom Kippur War. They won both intifadas. They're being divinely protected. Many people believe there are two battles of Gog and Magog, not only the one after the millennium, but one before it, and the stage is being set for that now, and Israel, by divine intervention, will win that as well. God is protecting Israel. But he's going to lift his protection from Israel. When they make the covenant with death with the Antichrist, he will enter the beautiful land. A time will come when God will stop protecting Israel. And a time will come when the Antichrist will come to power for three and a half years and make war against the saints. This is the shattering of the power of the holy people. The best way to understand it is to understand what happened to Jesus. Only after he was baptized by John did Jesus begin to do miracles and healings and things of this nature. He continued to do so until he was arrested. The last time was when he reattached the ear of the high priest's servant in Gethsemane. After that, Jesus was no longer empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he was no longer protected by the Father because he had taken our sin. And now the judgment of God was going to be poured upon him. The Holy Spirit, however, was still inside of Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. When he died on the cross, he gave up the Spirit. Okay. He gave up the ghost. The Spirit was always in him, but the Spirit stopped empowering him, and God stopped protecting him. When the son of perdition betrayed him. What happened to Jesus happens to the church. It's going to be betrayed, it's going to be brought before governors and kings, and it's going to face an hour of crucifixion, followed by an hour of glorious resurrection. Not all believers will be killed, but many will. Certainly two-thirds of the Jews are going to be killed separately, but in their experience after the church is removed. One way to understand this is the Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s. What Hitler, who had an Antichrist spirit, tried to do to exterminate the Jews is a picture of what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to try to do to exterminate believers. There will be the shattering of the power <coughs> of the holy people. One aspect is for believers. That's the one highlighted in Revelation 11, Revelation 13, and Revelation 14. The other is what is for Israel and the Jews, the shattering of the power of the holy people. Like Jesus, a time is going to come when we will no longer be empowered and our protection will be limited. That is what's going to happen. Why does God allow this? In the case of Jesus, he allowed it so Jesus could atone for our sin. In the case of the church, it's going to be, the church will have become so apostate, so corrupted, and so worldly that persecution becomes a necessary evil to distinguish the true believers from the false church. Now, this is a big issue. But this is the meaning of the shattering of the power of the holy people. The spirit no longer empowered Jesus, and divine protection was removed. That will happen to the church, and in another way, that will happen to Israel. Uh, the divine protection is going to be removed from Israel, and the Antichrist will enter the beautiful land 
and two-thirds of the Jews will die. Uh, but ultimately, Christ intervenes. First on behalf of the believers, then on behalf of Israel and the Jews. That is the meaning. I would point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast, and to our book, our Pezzo, where we explore these things in greater depth. Thank you for your question. Again, this cyber cult of women, they're ignorant, they're arrogant, and they're dishonest. I just ignore them. I think you should too. God bless. Thank you.